What have ants and beavers got to do with how humans develop language? In his book, Adam's Tongue, How Humans Made Language, How Language Made Humans, linguist Derek Bickerton uses a wide range of examples to explore why we humans have developed our unique skill of language. Animals communicate, but as far as we know, it's only humans that speak in coherent sentences and argue philosophy and swear and that sort of thing. Derek Bickerton speculates that a change in conditions sparked our early ancestors to speak in connected words. And it was not as hunter-gatherers, but as scavenging pre-humans on the bleak savannah plains that we developed our amazing facility. Now, Derek Bickerton is Professor Emeritus of Linguistics at the University of Hawaii. He suggests we develop our intelligence because we develop language. It's a view contrary to current theories on the evolution of language. He's speaking to the book shows Anita Barrow. The prevailing theories, first of all, they are what a colleague of mine called primate-centric. They're very much hooked on the great apes and because, of course, we are the greatest apes' closest relatives. And the idea is that there must be some kind of genetic continuity uh, in language as well as in our physique and all the other things. Okay. Uh, The second key thing, this is something incidentally I don't agree with, these both things I don't agree with, is that language somehow came out of what they call social intelligence, that is to say our abilities to deal with other members of our group, to uh, persuade them, to uh, maybe sometimes intimidate them, but certainly to make them do whatever we want them to do and manipulate them for our own purposes. For some, uh, this is widely believed that this made us more and more intelligent. And uh, when we got to a certain point, intelligent, well, language came along. They're not really quite sure how. You think the opposite. You think that, in fact, language was the thing that made us intelligent. Yes, exactly. That's where we part company. The idea that language somehow grew out of an animal communication system. All animals have systems by which they can communicate certain things, okay, that are immediate in their immediate environment. And this, these are called uh, animal communication systems. They're not really systems. They're collections of sounds or gestures and so forth that animals use to convey something to another animal of their own kind. And uh, I'm suggested that although language didn't just naturally grow out of an animal communication system, it must have been, it can only have arisen because something happened to some animal communication system of our predecessors that sort of burst that system, exploded it, because animal communication is very much limited to the here and now. You really can't talk about things that happen, things are going to happen, things that are happening in the next uh, county or whatever. You base this theory on, I guess, another theory, which is, it's a bit technical, but but let's have a go, of of the niche construction theory, and, and you use some nice um, animal behaviours and things to explain this. Can you just very yeah. briefly look... Let's talk about beavers, for example. Oh, I'd love to talk about beavers, yeah. The uh, beaver originally, or beaver's ancestors, were kind of rather unspecialised rodents that uh, lived on the banks of streams and built their dens on the banks of streams, were, of course, they're extremely vulnerable to rises and falls in the water level and so forth. So what happened is beavers started to, uh, they figured somehow, we don't know how, that uh, if you stop the flow of water, then uh, you wouldn't get your uh, uh, home alternately flooded and left high and dry. So what they did was start to build dams. And in order to build dams, what did they have to do? They had to gnaw through the trunks of trees going in or near the water and uh, drag the tree into the river and keep on piling these trees up until uh, they'd actually managed to block the flow. And then you've got, of course, a large pool stretching out behind the dam and in the walls, the sides of this pool, of course, they could safely build their dens. So what happened is they changed their appearance radically. Uh, They grew this enormous tail to steer by. They had these huge paddle-like feet to swim with. 
they got all kinds of physical adaptations that fitted themselves for the, the particular kind of life that they'd chosen. But the point was they had to choose that kind of life first. It wasn't the question that they suddenly, their genes mutated, and this is the usual thing you hear about mutation. You know, genes mutate and uh, the body changes and then you do different things. This isn't true. What happens is that you start doing different things and the point is once you do something different, that changes the selective pressure. It's an something adapt- that helps an you. adaptive um, process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've made this. In, they've actually changed the environment they're living in. They've sh- yeah. changed their niche, if you like. Yeah. But that's not all that they've changed. They've actually made themselves. They changed themselves. themselves. It's a feedback process. Uh, it's a two-way street. What happens is the beaver starts to change its environment. This changes the selective pressures, sort of traits that the, the beaver had that didn't use, genes that never got switched on, suddenly start getting switched on. Uh, again, the odd mutation here and there will help out. If they get a mutation that's favorable to the new life, it will be selected, whereas before it wouldn't have been. So what happens is that you get a change. As the beaver is working, as the environment gradually begins to change, the influence of the environment begins to change the beaver, which makes the beaver much better at exploiting the environment, which in turn makes it the environment work more or further on the on the uh, beaver's genes to uh, fit it to the to the task it's chosen. And this is why you get these uh, real creationist arguments where they say, well, there's such a wonderful fit uh, between the animal and its surroundings. This has to have been the work of a designer. No, it wasn't the work of a designer. You, you think it's a, uh, it's a kind of a game of consequence? Consequences in a way, isn't it? In a way. Or, it, or, or it's, if it's, you're in the CIA, a blowback, perhaps. <laughs> well, basically a series of blowbacks. It's, it's, it's a continuous changing process. Derek Bickerton uses other animal behaviours ranging from bees, ants, parrots, even worms to solve what is one of the hardest scientific questions. How did we develop language? Linguists such as Noam Chomsky believe we developed an innate universal grammar adapted from earlier animal communication systems after we developed thought. Derek believes language helped us develop thought. He paints a picture of a world about two and a half million years ago. The weather became drier, nuts and forest fruits were scarce and our pre-human relatives were driven out onto the savannah to scavenge the prehistoric equivalent of roadkill. While our ancestors had developed rudimentary tools, including sharp rock flakes, handy for ripping off tough hides to get at the meat, the trouble was we were small, on two legs, and competing with other animals who were more adapted to the region. We needed an edge. If we could get a large numbers of uh, our fellow pre-humans together, then, and if we could use the the stone tools we made, if we could drive off the other scavengers, then it would be possible to get at the meat. But it wouldn't be possible unless we had the numbers. And by numbers, I mean maybe 60, 80, 100. You'd need that many. So what happens then is that uh, imagine for yourself if you had to collect a hundred apes and get them to do the same thing at the same time. What would your chances be? Zero. Apes are very individualistic. I mean, all the primates are, and of course, we still are in many ways, but we're also very cooperative. This is a case of if we don't all cooperate together, nobody will get the goodies. But if we do cooperate together, everybody will get the goodies. And and this is the take-home message that eventually got through our ancestors' heads. But the only way they could do that was if somebody could communicate what it was that they had to do, where it was that they had to go, what they could expect to find when they got there. Because if they didn't, if you couldn't tell them this, there's absolutely no reason why they should give up whatever they were doing at the moment and suddenly start doing what you told them to do. So how much language do you think they needed? How much language did we start off with? Very little. (laughs) You're saying about Um, 10 words words or fewer, I think. (laughs) If that, if that, maybe two or three. The point was, you see, that... uh, 
There was the idea. Once you got the idea of what a word was, this was the breakthrough. The idea that a word was something that could mean, could convey a meaning to you in the absence of the thing that it described. So different that from a, an actual yeah. signal. It's a symbolic work or, or an iconic word, right. something. Infer yeah. something or, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and it, 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 it evokes in your mind. When I say elephant, you, you think of something with tusks and a trunk and a tail and whatever. You know, the purpose of of, uh, a symbol is to create a picture of something in the mind uh, when the thing itself isn't there. And you have absolutely no indication of even what the person's talking about. But as soon as they say elephant, you immediately get a mental picture of something with a trunk and big ears and tusks and so forth. Why would it have happened specifically to one particular group of animals and not to another? at the same time in well, the same conditions. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm saying that there must have been different conditions. Uh, you only get a unique result if you get a unique cause. Now, uh, very few species actually have a need for what, a, what, what, what I'm talking about here, getting numbers together in order to exploit food sources. This is something that's very rare because apes will, will give uh, food calls when there's food right in front of them. But I'm talking about conveying information about something that the other uh, animal can't see in order to get the other animal to do something. Okay, and that's, that's what I call recruitment. And it's, it turns out very few species practice recruitment, um, ants, bees, and uh, probably immature ravens. Could, you, could that, you envisage a time when ants might develop language? We, we have <laughs> another changes in weather patterns, uh, mm-hmm. conditions well, might it, change. If it made them multiply in size, if it made them grow to be at least, uh, what should we say, sheep size, yeah, it could happen. Uh, but you have to do that as well. And that's not difficult because somebody figured out that a mouse uh, could get to be the size of an elephant in, in I think, 3,000 generations with only a minute change in the size of each generation. So it's not impossible. You might have giant ants. Well, but they'd have to be big because you have to have a big brain as well. So, um, But there is a chance for ravens if they uh, weren't birds. It's tricky to be, uh, imagine the bird civilization. But, Developing uh, syntax. <laughs> <laughs> but they're getting, yeah, it's possible. It's not at all impossible. The question is, do they actually, there's a lot of evidence which suggests that they are capable of this, but nobody's actually caught them doing it, is the point. But the interesting thing about this is, is uh, a man called Tecumseh Fitch, who is uh, now working in Vienna, is actually carrying out an experiment to see if ravens can spot a liar. Because if they're communicating information, suppose you communicate information and then somebody manipulates things so that information turns out to be false, what happens? Well, you can prove there must have been some information if there are consequences for the person who's been shown up or the animal has been shown up as a liar. Uh, if you can catch them doing it, then uh, first of all, I got my hypothesis, at least part of it is, is supported. And uh, second, you've got the possibility that sooner or later you might have ravens who could really chat away to you. That would be interesting. I wonder what we'd talk about. Wouldn't it just? (laughs) Wouldn't it? Uh, Maybe they'd be twittering. (laughs) I'm sure we'd tweet back. (laughs) You are challenging current views. You give language a bigger role in evolution than others in your field. I do, because I think before language, I don't think you could symbolise. And if you couldn't symbolise, you couldn't think. You see, we think in symbols as well as talk in symbols. And uh, without you have symbols, neither language nor any kind of organised thought is possible. But the point is that right off from the start, once you got the idea of what language was, then, of course, you could think of a hundred uses for it. The beauty of this particular idea is that it just one word or, or being able to make a noise like an elephant when there wasn't an elephant there so you could get people to come, you, you know. That, that leads to poetry, to philosophy, to, to swearing and all of the rest of the of things. of course. Of course, of course, because it's all so useful once you know how to do it. It's, it's inc- an incredible power it gives you. Oh, uh, how, how, why how, don't we know that other animals don't have this capacity? There are animals who 
display empathy, d- who display a sure. theory of mind, for example. Right. Um, yeah. Dolphins have enormous brains almost as – How above. do we know that they don't have language? If they had language, they would have thought. If they had thought, they would use it to benefit themselves by changing the world around it, just as we benefited ourselves by changing the world around us. And that is not the slightest uh, indication that they have ever done this or been able to do this. How radical is your idea? You, you're, you describe it as heretic. Um, I disagree with most people in the field. That's, that's true. Uh, but uh, there it is. Who is the audience for this book? Well, I think anybody who's interested in, in uh, why are humans the way they are and, and why are they so different from other animals? Are they really different from other animals? And how can it be that they evolved if this is so? Anyone who's asked themselves questions like this uh, should be interested in this book. It, the writing is it's part sort of conversational and part rhetorical, mm, part yeah. placing <laughs> the, the audience saying, how about if we... We hmm. had a go at thinking like this. I write this book as if I was in a bar with you or something and arguing with you and uh, this sort of – this rather uh, approach because, frankly, I think <laughs> there's too much distance. There's, there's too much of this distancing. There's too much of this idea that there is an educated elite and they're way above the rest of the world and this kind of thing. And, and in fact, going with that pub uh, reference, it's, it, the book's been described hmm. as both irreverent and deeply impolite. Like you've had a, a few glasses <laughs> well, too many. Occasionally, and said occasionally the wrong I may have thing. said, well, I, I, I tend to let go a little, I'm afraid. I, I, my wife is always giving me a hard time about that. Probably deserve it. There, <laughs> there is a sense that you are also not just to that person in the pub, but you're throwing down the gauntlet to other specialists, such as. Noam Chomsky, Steve Pinker, and Mark. Oh, I definitely want to. Th- yeah, I definitely want to throw down the the uh, the gauntlet. Uh, definitely. Derek Bickerton there speaking with Anita Barrow from Hawaii, where he's Emeritus Professor of Linguistics at the University of Hawaii. Adam's Tongue, How Humans Made Language and Language Made Humans is published by Hill and Wang. Now on tomorrow's book show, my conversation with John Ralston Saul from the Sydney Writers' Festival, essayist, writer of highly influential books like The Doubter's Companion and The Unconscious Civilization. He's also president of International Pen, the global writers organisation. So um, he's got this extraordinary commitment to civil society and where does it come from? That's on tomorrow's program. And this Wednesday evening at 6pm, join me at Melbourne's Wheeler Centre where I'll take the pulse of the reading life of doctors. A psychiatrist, an oncologist and a heart surgeon join me for our monthly event, Reading on Vocation. What books are on their bookshelves alongside Grey's Anatomy? The event's free, but you need to book and you can do that by going to our website and clicking on the Wheeler Centre icon. Remember, you can hear this program tonight at 8 o'clock uh, or on the, on the net or pod it. That's the book show. I'm Ramona Koval. Coming up, first person.